Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or you've been here this whole time, and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure your notifications are set to all so it reminds you of every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee. All of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and enjoy your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases, Volume 13. Disclaimer. Some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. Caution, before I read this first case, it does involve kids, but I will do my best to leave out all the trigger words that may upset some. Listening discretion is highly advised. Susan Smith, child murderer, eligible for parole in 2024. The Susan Smith Murders. The story of Susan Smith from Union, South Carolina, left a lasting impact, and decades later, still evokes strong emotions. The tragic and deeply unsettling case affected many people. In 1994, Smith called the police and claimed that a black man stole her car with her two young sons still inside. The carjacking or abduction scenario was distressing enough, but the truth that eventually emerged was even more horrifying. In actuality, Susan Smith had strapped three-year-old Michael and one-year-old Alex into their car seats, driven her car to a boat ramp, and pushed the vehicle into a lake, causing her two sons to drown. It took nine days for the truth to come out, and even then, investigators, family members, and the public were baffled as to how a mother could so callously murder her children. Smith's Confession Veteran agent Pete Logan, who worked for both the FBI and the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division, or SLED, led the investigation into Susan Smith's claims. Several early clues indicated that she was not telling the truth. The first clue came when Logan interviewed a city maintenance worker who said that the traffic light where Smith claimed to have stopped didn't turn red unless there were other cars present, which contradicted her story. Confronted with this, Smith changed her story and said that the carjacking took place on a different road 10 miles away, but surveillance video contradicted this story too. When Logan and the sheriff again confronted Smith on her collapsing narrative, she finally confessed. According to former agent Logan, Smith fell to her knees and cried hysterically. Why did Susan Smith kill her kids? Smith's tearful interviews were even more haunting in retrospect, with the knowledge that a mother could perpetrate such an unimaginable crime against her two children and then lie to cover it up. At the time of her confession and arrest, the news media reported that Smith committed the heinous crime because the man with whom she was having an affair, Tom Finlay, didn't want children. However, during her trial, Seymour Halick, a psychiatrist and law professor, testified for the defense that Smith was suffering from severe depression and suicidal ideation and was having multiple sexual affairs, including with Finley's father, J. Carey Finley, as well as her own stepfather, Beverly Russell, and others. Smith later denied that the affair with Finley was her motivation and argued that she was not the monster people thought she was. Twenty years after her conviction, she penned a letter that read, quote, Something went very wrong that night. I was not myself. I was a good mother, and I loved my boys. There was no motive, as it was not even a planned event. I was not in my right mind. However, Smith's acts were as deceptive as they were heinous. For nine days following the incident, she made emotional televised pleas, along with her then-husband David, for the safe return of her babies. Additionally, investigators learned that Smith began manufacturing her lies and alibi while running through the woods, 
immediately after pushing her sons into the lake. In other words, she knew what she had done was wrong. After her conviction, the defense argued that Smith suffered from a variety of mental health issues and was diagnosed with dependent personality disorder. The jury spared her the death penalty and opted for a life sentence. Susan Smith's life in prison. Though initially held in the Women's Correctional Center in Columbia, Smith was transferred to and incarcerated at Leith Correctional Institution in Greenwood, South Carolina, due to various sex scandals. While in prison, she received at least five infractions for self-mutilation, the use and possession of narcotics or marijuana, and other violations. Sexual Relations with Guards while incarcerated, Smith was also consistently flagged for engaging in sexual relationships with guards. According to the New York Post, Smith's first two decades behind bars were spent engaged in a cyclone of bad behavior. As a result, securing parole may be difficult for the convicted child murderer, especially taking into account an incident in 2000. At that time, 28-year-old Smith was caught engaging in sexual activities with the 50-year-old prison guard, Houston Cagle, which resulted in an STD, according to the Daily Mail. Cagle was jailed for more than three months for the affair. In the subsequent year, prison captain Alfred Rowe confessed to having sexual relations with Smith, which resulted in him receiving a five-year probation sentence. Smith faced disciplinary actions twice in 2010 and once in 2015 for drug offenses, resulting in a loss of privileges for over a year. These privileges typically encompass visitation rights, access to the canteen, and telephone usage. Former cellmates procured drugs for Smith. Christy Smith, Smith's former cellmate, said Smith paid her to procure drugs. Stephanie Holsey, another former cellmate, told People that inmates were able to get pills for other inmates by stashing them in their upper cheeks to avoid detection by the guards. Quote, I've seen Susan do everything, snort, booty bump, swallow, shoot. I've seen her do it all. My main purpose was to bring her her pills. Christy Smith, Susan Smith's cellmate. Long distance romance fizzles out. In 2021, Smith began a long-distance romance with a divorced father of two grown children. The man in a long-distance relationship with Smith contacted her after seeing her in a television interview. According to People, in one of the letters, Smith wrote, quote, We're going to have amazing chemistry in person. I can't wait to build a life with you. Leave the past mistakes behind and start fresh, just you and me. According to family members, however, that romance ran its course. Susan Smith up for parole in 2024. Susan Smith becomes eligible for parole in November of 2024, which has raised concerns and stirred outrage, given the gravity of her actions and her lasting impact on countless lives. Many believe that parole should never be granted in her case. Family members have previously expressed skepticism that Smith would be paroled. I don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell of getting paroled in 2024, a family member said. I think her husband, David, realized that too. She's exactly where she needs to be. Susan Smith's former husband today. Susan Smith's former husband, David Smith, remarried and has children with his new wife. In interviews, he has said he's forever haunted by what happened to his sons. There's always this nagging and gnawing heartache, David Smith said in 2010. It's there every day, even if I'm not always conscious of it. In 2011, Smith spoke at a child death training workshop for prosecutors, paramedics, and law enforcement officers in Columbia, an event sponsored by the State Law Enforcement Division. Mothers Who Kill Their Children In recent years, studies have attempted to better understand maternal filicide and its causes. Texas Tech University's Martha Smithy, who has spent her career studying infanticide, stated that the phenomenon goes beyond mental illness. Quote, 
The economic inequality of women leaves mothers with paychecks that are insufficient, and they are powerless to change their situation. For the mothers who commit infanticide, the struggles overwhelms them, and they commit a terrible, heavily regretted act that costs them their child's life, their family, their freedom, and their peace of mind for the rest of their lives. Smithy concluded, My work and that of others makes me realize that anyone is capable of hurting a child. Everyone has a recipe for losing it and assaulting others. Most people manage to dance around the recipe and maintain control. You all know I don't say anything or give you my peace of mind after cases, but I wanted to read this case because I do not understand how a mother that took her children's life would even be considered for parole. I don't care what year it is. I'm sorry. She drowned her babies. She ought to be waterboarded until she drowns or just lock her up in one of those huge 50-gallon barrels of water. Let her drown and see what that feels like. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Move on to the next case. Patricia Rohrer, murderer or railroaded innocent woman. Patricia Rohrer case. One of the most intriguing true crime stories remains unknown to many. The case of the murder of Joanne Katrinak and her three-month-old son, Alex. On December 15, 1994, Joanne and Alex went missing from Catasauqua, Pennsylvania. Her husband, Andy Katrinak, alerted the authorities that night. The remains of the young mother and her baby were discovered four months later in the woods. Andy was the initial suspect, but the investigation eventually led to Patricia Rohrer, one of his former girlfriends who occasionally kept in touch. A couple of weeks before the disappearances, she called Andy's house. Joanne answered and, using profanity, told her never to call again. According to the prosecution theory of the case, an infuriated Rohrer drove 500 miles from her home in North Carolina to stalk and then kill Joanne and her baby. Confusing DNA Testing Choices In 2017, true crime author Tammy Maul made a strong case for Rohrer's innocence in a book entitled Convenient Suspect, A Double Murder, A Flawed Investigation, and the Railroading of an Innocent Woman. Her arguments for innocence were based on trial transcripts, FBI, and police reports, and the investigative work of late journalist Margaret Sneary. Maul conducted multiple interviews with Rohrer about the case. However, the detectives and prosecutor declined to participate, resulting in a book that presets a one-sided account. Did they refuse to participate because they had railroaded Rohrer? According to Maul, there are many elements of the investigation that are troubling. For instance, the police recovered several items from the crime scene, including a cigarette butt and a broken nail with skin attached. Yet, these items were not tested for DNA. A hair found in Joanne's hand was also never tested. Instead, investigators relied on hair samples from Joanne's car that matched Rohrer's mitochondrial DNA, a type of testing now considered unreliable and inconclusive. In 2017, the cigarette butt was DNA tested, and DNA on the cigarette butt found near the two bodies belonged to Patricia Rohrer. If anyone doubts the result of that test, their skepticism isn't completely unwarranted. The fingernail with skin attached was found on Joanne's chest. Since investigators didn't run a DNA test on the sample, Rohrer's lawyers received a judge's approval to send it to a lab for testing. However, the skin had been removed when the sample arrived at the lab, making a DNA test impossible. The judge had determined the sample was intact and testable when he gave his approval. Yet, by the time it reached the lab, there was no longer the case. The skin had been removed somewhere between the judge examining the sample and its arrival at the lab. Prosecutor Mike McIntyre claims that the nail found on Joanne was one of her own nails. However, according to Maul, a forensic report determined that the fingernail differed in size from the victim in width and grooming. 
An obvious question is why police and prosecutors relied on unreliable mitochondrial DNA testing when they had a skin sample and cigarette butt with nuclear DNA available to test. And why was a skin sample removed? Why was a strand of hair found in Joanne's hand never tested, while hairs found in her car were analyzed? Surely, a hair found in her hand that could have been pulled from her killer's head would have been far more relevant to the case than hairs found in the car that someone had left days or weeks earlier. During a TV interview about the case, McIntyre was asked why the hair in Joanne's hand hadn't been tested. He answered, You're right. You got me. We should have tested it. One of the investigators said, I don't know. When asked, Other Arguments for Innocence Tammy Mall makes other compelling arguments for her belief that Rohrer was railroaded by investigators. According to the prosecution theory of the case, Patricia Rohrer spent five days in Pennsylvania around the time of the disappearance of Joanne and Alex, but no witnesses saw her. Mall points out that Rohrer is almost six feet tall and speaks with a southern accent. At the time, she drove a van with North Carolina plates and the words Riverwood Stables written on the side. Maul believes that Rohrer would have stuck out like a sore thumb in a small town like Catasauqua. The disappearance has happened a couple of weeks before Christmas, but no one in North Carolina who knew Rohrer had any recollections of her being away. Rohrer was also under surveillance at the time by locals who believed she was involved in horse thefts. These locals began surveillance on the day the police say Rohrer began her trip to Pennsylvania. Their surveillance of Rohrer ended on December 16, 1994, a day after Joanne and Alex disappeared. The surveillance notes were lost after they were turned over to the police. Based on the police and prosecution claims, Rohrer spent more than seven hours hiding in the Cadernac home, waiting for Joanne and Alex to leave. When they went outside, she cut the phone line. Maul believes this doesn't make sense because the cut was in a hard-to-reach area. There, tucked up near the floor joists and almost hidden in the insulation, two wires dangled in the empty air. Even if Rohrer felt that cutting a phone line after Joanne had already gone outside was crucial to her plan, it makes no sense that she would have chosen a hard-to-access area when she could have chosen an easier-to-access part of the phone line. Those seven hours in the basement present another problem for the case against Rohrer. Tammy Mall asks, how long did she intend to wait around in that basement? She couldn't have known Joanne was going to leave the house that day, so why not confront her as soon as she entered? Rohrer also managed to hide for several hours undetected, without leaving behind any evidence like fingerprints and footprints. Police claim that Joanne was kidnapped outside her house, but two neighbors in separate houses said they saw her leaving and didn't notice anything unusual. Maul also doesn't believe Joanne would have gone quietly with a kidnapper, casting doubts on the prosecution theory that Joanne and Alex were kidnapped outside their home, pointing out that Rohrer would have needed several tools to break into the Cadernac basement. Maul says, Here's Patty juggling a gun, a cordless screwdriver, a pair of wire cutters, and a crowbar, while at the same time contending with a terrified woman holding a diaper bag, a purse, and a baby. Joanne's car was found in the parking lot of a nearby pub. The police claimed that Rohrer forced Joanne to drive into the woods. After the killings, she drove the car to the pub parking lot. It makes no sense that Rohrer would risk being seen driving Joanne's car to a busy area. Some eyewitnesses claim that the car had been parked in the same parking space all day since 12.30 p.m., about half an hour after neighbors said they saw Joanne leaving the house. A forensic analysis of the vehicle found no evidence it had been in the woods. A detective interviewed Rohrer a week after the disappearances. He said she had no scratches or bruises, consistent with a violent struggle, even though evidence indicated Joanne put up a fight to protect herself and her son. Analysis of insects found on Joanne called into question when the bodies were left in the woods. 
the December and January timeframes would not have allowed the insects to reach the specific age and development of the insects he found. The earliest date the insects could have gotten on the body was February 18, 1995. If this is accurate, Rohrer would have needed to hide the bodies somewhere else in December. She would then have had to have made a return trip to Pennsylvania in February to move the remains to the woods. The Wrong Man, a TV show on the Stars Network that investigated the case, concluded that nearby residents would have heard a gunshot if Joanne had been shot in the area where her body had been found. Argument for Guilt While Maul makes a compelling case for innocence, Rohrer was convicted by a jury of her peers. There are some possible reasons why those jurors believe she was guilty. Rohrer had a reputation of being an aggressive troublemaker. She received 12 months probation for shoplifting at a Walmart. There were also accusations against her for neglecting her horses, breaking into barns and being part of a horse-stealing operation. However, she was never charged in those investigations. Joanne and Alex disappeared just days after Joanne and Rohrer had a phone confrontation. Rohrer had a possible match for hairs found in Joanne's car and at the crime scene. While Maul points out that thousands of people were possible matches, it is interesting that one possible match was Andy Katarnak's ex-girlfriend, who kept in touch with him. Joanne was shot once with a 22 caliber gun before being bludgeoned to death. A witness testified that Rohrer owned a 22 caliber gun that frequently jammed after one shot was fired. Rohrer said she attended a club the night Joanne went missing. The club required attendees to sign in, but her name wasn't on the sign-in sheet for that evening. However, Maul points out that Rohrer took dance classes at the club, so she would have arrived before the sign-in sheets were available. Mal also said that many attendees didn't bother to sign in. Rohrer often made long-distance phone calls. According to her call logs, she didn't make long-distance calls for a few days around the time of the disappearances. Maul points out that Rohrer had other occasional gaps when no calls were made. If Rohrer was at home in North Carolina and went through a rare multi-day period where she made no long-distance calls, it was a very unlucky coincidence for her that Joanne and Alex just happened to go missing at the same time. Darley Peters, who was involved in the surveillance of Rohrer, said, quote, Patty wasn't around much during the days. Maul points out that Peters never indicated that Patty or her van were missing the entire time, nor did anyone else who participated in the surveillance. However, it doesn't look good for Rohrer when someone surveying her says she wasn't around much during that period. The drive from her home in North Carolina to Catasauqua is about seven to eight hours. Rohrer could have been gone for a couple of days without anyone noticing her absence. Some witnesses claimed that Rohrer was obsessed with Andy Katerinak, although others said she had moved on with her life. Mal briefly addresses the possibility of Rohrer working with an accomplice, but quickly dismisses it likely because such a scenario would weaken many of her claims of innocence. If Rohrer did have an accomplice, she wouldn't have needed that distinctive band with Riverwood stables on the side to get around Catastaqua. The fingernail that wasn't hers could have belonged to that individual. When Joanne put up a fight to try to save herself, she would have required the accomplice, not Rohrer. If the body was moved to the woods in February, the accomplice could have done it. Guilty or not. Rohrer continues to insist that she is innocent, pointing the finger of blame at Joanne's husband, Andy. Patricia made this statement on the website patriciarohr.com. Quote, Andy also failed at least two lie detector tests, and before an arrest was made in the murders, moved almost all the way across the country without telling the police. Really? While the police are still investigating the murder of your wife and child? What about Joanne's best friend, who told the producers of Wrong Man that Joanne was saving up money and planning to leave Andy right after the holidays? 
Judges for Justice, a nonprofit founded by retired judges to overturn wrongful convictions, also believes she is innocent. The group's founder expects that Royer's conviction will be overturned. They made a video highlighting what they see on some problems with the case against her. This is a tough case for multiple reasons. First, it was a disturbing crime involving a young mother and her infant son. Evidence that should have been DNA tested at the time wasn't. A skin sample was destroyed before being sent to a lab for testing. Hairs that were tested relied on currently discredited methods. The case against the accused is circumstantial. She could have done it, and it's impossible to rule out her involvement. But there isn't any slam-dunk evidence of guilt. If she did do it, then Joanne and Alex have received the justice they deserve. If she didn't do it, the person or people who committed this horrible crime haven't been held accountable. Prosecutor Mike McIntyre has no doubts about Rohrer's guilt. He wrote a book about the case called Hair Trigger, the true story of the investigation, trial, and aftermath of the Kataranak family murders. Robert Durst, real estate heir turned murderer. A shroud of mystery. Intriguing and elusive, Robert Durst, 1994 to 2022, evokes a sense of familiarity, as if he could be anyone's grandfather or kindly rich uncle. Yet fortune did not smile upon those who could have been his descendants, for Durst had no biological children. Born into wealth, he trod lightly in his family's real estate empire, scarcely holding down a job. However, his notoriety did not stem from business triumphs, but from a cloud of suspicion surrounding multiple disappearances and murders. The Disappearance of Durst's First Wife Durst, the son of the wealthy and highly successful New York real estate developer Seymour Durst, entered into matrimony with Kathleen Kathy McCormick, a dental hygienist, in 1973. Their marriage encountered difficulties, and though they separated in 1980, they did not formally divorce. During this period, People magazine reported that Durst began dating Mia Farrow's sister, Prudence, who famously inspired the Beatles song, Dear Prudence. Kathy was last seen alive on January 31st of 1982. Despite residing in separate apartments in Manhattan, they still maintained a shared cottage in Westchester County, New York, as detailed in a People article focusing on the research for Kathy. On the night of her disappearance, Kathy attended a party hosted by her girlfriend, Gilberte Najami, in Newtown, Connecticut. However, she abruptly left after receiving an angry phone call from her estranged husband. In a 2001 interview with ABC News, Najami revealed that Kathleen had visited her home visibly distressed, engaging in phone conversations with her estranged husband, who demanded she return home immediately. Najami recalled the chilling parting words of her friend as Kathleen implored her friend to investigate if anything were to happen to her, expressing fear of what Bobby Durst might do. Contradicting accounts emerged as Durst informed investigators that he and his wife had argued upon her return to their South Salem, New York cottage that evening. Durst claimed he then drove her to the train station before returning to Manhattan. Five days later, Durst contacted the police to report Kathy missing. People magazine detailed a doorman's account of seeing a woman resembling Kathy from behind on the day Durst claimed she returned to Manhattan. Additionally, the dean of the medical school where Kathy was studying stated he returned a call from a woman claiming to be Kathy, reporting illness and the possibility of missing class. In 2000, Westchester County investigators reopened the investigation into Kathy Durst's disappearance, initially classified as a missing persons case rather than a murder. The following year, 
Kathy was declared dead despite the fact that no body was ever found. Quick note, Durst was eventually charged with murder and the death of his first wife. Nearly four decades after she disappeared and just days after he was sentenced to life in prison in California for killing a confidant who helped him cover up the slaying. The Murder of Susan Berman Durst's close friend, Susan Berman, was found dead from a gunshot wound to the head in her Los Angeles home in December of 2000. Berman had allegedly helped Durst cover up the disappearance of his wife. Durst was suspected but not charged until much later. Evidence from the Jinx documentary, particularly a letter Durst sent to Berman, with handwriting and misspellings matching those on a note, sent to the police at the time of Bourbon's murder, played a crucial role in this case. As detailed in a 2001 New York Times article, Susan Berman's family and friends were initially not suspicious of Robert Durst and believed he would never harm her. The closeness of their relationship was evident when Durst had the honor of giving her away at her wedding in 1984. At that time, their bond appeared unbreakable, leaving those close to Susan Berman unsuspecting of any potential wrongdoing by Durst. A Mobster's Daughter Berman had an interesting life with various notable achievements. She was a writer and journalist who authored several books, including Easy Street, The True Story of a Gangster's Daughter, 2002, which recounted her experiences growing up as the daughter of a notorious Las Vegas mobster. Berman also worked as a freelance journalist, contributing to various publications. Berman was born in Las Vegas, Nevada on February 18, 1945. She was the daughter of David Davy Berman, a prominent figure in organized crime associated with the Flamingo Hotel and Casino and the Las Vegas underworld during the mid-20th century. Her mother was Gertrude Gert Berman. She was a showgirl. Berman's mother was tragically murdered when Susan was just a teenager. The unsolved killing of her mother deeply affected Berman and played a significant role in her life. Berman and Durst became friends while attending graduate school at the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. They maintained a close relationship throughout the years, and Berman was believed to have helped Durst during his troubled times, including covering up the disappearance of his first wife. Tragically, Berman was murdered in her home in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles, on December 24th of 2000. The investigation into her death remained unsolved for many years until new evidence emerged. In 2015, Durst was arrested in New Orleans by the FBI on a murder warrant issued by a Los Angeles judge related to Berman's death. After a protracted legal battle in 2021, Durst was convicted of Berman's murder. Durst's actions and the subsequent investigations have stirred significant interest in true crime communities and has contributed to an ongoing debate about wealth, power, and justice in the United States. Morris Black's Death In 2001, while Durst was living in Galveston, Texas, under an assumed identity, he was charged with the murder of his neighbor, Morris Black. Black resided in the same apartment complex as Durst in Gabelston. They lived in separate units, but their paths crossed as neighbors. Despite their proximity, the nature of their relationship remains somewhat unclear. Durst admitted to dismembering Black's body and dumping it in the Gabelston Bay while claiming that he killed Black in self-defense. In 2003, he was acquitted of murder but was convicted of tampering with evidence and jumping bail. Durst lived as a cross-dressing mute woman. While living next door to Black, Durst assumed a false identity using a woman's name. He posed as a mute woman named Dorothy Sinner and presented himself to such to his neighbors, including Black. Durst's decision to live under a different identity added an additional layer of complexity and intrigue to the already peculiar circumstances surrounding his association 
with black. HBO Documentary In the HBO Documentary series, The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, Durst made a shocking, infamous statement. During the series' final episode, while in the bathroom but unaware that his microphone was still recording, Durst muttered to himself, What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. This chilling statement has been widely discussed and analyzed concerning Durst's suspected involvement in the disappearances and murders of various individuals throughout his life. You can watch the documentary on Max, formerly known as HBO. The Demise of Robert Durst Durst met a tragic end as a prisoner in Stockton, California at the age of 78. Confirming his demise, Durst's lawyer, Chip Lewis, stated that he passed away at San Joaquin General Hospital while undergoing testing. Durst went into cardiac arrest and could not be revived. Before his death, he had been serving a life sentence for Berman's murder at the California Health Care Facility in Stockton. Described by Wikipedia as a state prison for incarcerated patients with long-term medical needs or acute mental health needs. Durst's conviction of Berman's murder came in September, and shortly after, he tested positive for COVID-19, requiring a brief period on a ventilator. According to his attorney, the virus exacerbated Durst's pre-existing medical conditions, leading to a deterioration in his health and ultimate death. Durst was fascinating and also evil. Despite his meager physical stature and slender frame, he was a cross-dressing fugitive, evading justice while harboring a substantial fortune of $100 million. During this time on the run, he adopted a vagabond lifestyle, engaging in public acts of indecency such as urinating in public spaces. At times, he resorted to disguising himself as a mute woman. Disturbingly, he subjected his wife to domestic violence and allegedly coerced her into an abortion. The demise of Durst marked the culmination of a life characterized by dark mysteries, shocking crimes, and a trail of unanswered questions that will forever remain etched into the annals of true crime history. An American Tragedy, The Rapid Murder of Kelly Hall the Last Shift of Kelly Hall The evening of Thursday, February 10, 1989, was bitterly cold. The wind blew down Interstate 70 in St. Charles, Missouri, sweeping past the doors of two gas stations that faced each other on 5th Street. One was a mobile station where 17-year-old Kelly Hall was finishing an eight-hour shift. At approximately 10.55 p.m., her boyfriend was parked in his car behind the gas station, waiting for Kelly to appear. He sat patiently, most likely listening to the radio as he gazed out his windshield into the black winter sky. Kelly had one final task to complete before she locked up for the night, checking the fuel levels of the four underground gas tanks at the front of the station. Almost done with work and excited to see her boyfriend, who was waiting just a few feet away behind the gas station, she went out the front door. Jeffrey Ferguson and Kenneth Owsley Earlier that evening, at around 8 p.m., Jeffrey Ferguson visited his friend Melvin Hendrick at Hendrick's home in the St. Charles area. Ferguson was looking to sell his gun. Hendrick wasn't interested in purchasing, but suggested checking out Brothers Bar down the street. The two of them went to the bar, but had no luck finding a buyer. Hendrick decided to go home. Ferguson called another friend, Kenneth Owsley, and asked him for a ride. Owsley picked Ferguson up in his brown and white Chevy Blazer, and together the two cruised down 5th Street. When they pulled into the gas station at 10.55 p.m., Ferguson still had his gun. Kelly Hall goes missing. It's not clear precisely what happened next, but a witness reported 
seeing a brown and white Chevy Blazer at the Shell gas station around the time Kelly was outside recording the fuel levels. The Blazer drove across the street and pulled into the mobile station. The witness reported seeing Kelly in front of the mobile station, standing next to a white male who had one hand in his pocket. The witness saw Kelly get into the back seat of the Chevy Blazer. That was the last time she was seen alive. By 11.30 p.m., Kelly's boyfriend wondered what was taking her so long. He exited his vehicle and walked to the front of the gas station. The front door was unlocked, but he did not see Kelly. He called out for her. There was no reply. The only sound he heard was the howling wind. He began to feel uneasy, a feeling that grew worse when he saw Kelly's purse, but no sign of Kelly. He dialed her phone number, thinking perhaps she went home and forgot her purse. He was told Kelly was not there. He knew something was very wrong. He called the police. News of Kelly's disappearance hit the news stations the next morning. Kelly's photo was seen in all the papers. Still, no one heard from her and there were no reported sightings. Items found on the highway. The next morning, a Chesterfield City worker saw some items strewn along Crabcore Mill Road. Tennis shoes, underwear, a shirt, a coat, and a blue sweater with the mobile insignia. In the pocket of the coat was writing on a piece of paper, which contained notations about the fuel pumps of two of the underground gas tanks. When Melvin Hendricks saw the news report about the missing teenager, he became suspicious of Jeffrey Ferguson. Hendrick had a friend who worked for the FBI. On Monday, he contacted the friend and told him about his suspicion. The friend set up Hendrick to wear a wire. Hendrick's Suspicions Hendrick contacted Ferguson and, wearing a wire, met him at a bar. Ferguson spoke candidly about the media frenzy over the case. They are making a big thing over this. It's just another bitch who lost it, he said unaware that FBI agents were listening. From that point on, investigators viewed Ferguson as the prime suspect in Hall's disappearance. Soon thereafter, authorities arrested him. He again stated that he was asleep at home on the night Hall went missing. But with no one to support his alibi, Ferguson remained in police custody. A grisly and heartbreaking discovery. On February 22, 1989, Warren Stem made his way to a machine shed on his farm in Maryland Heights, a suburb of St. Louis. Suddenly, he stopped in his tracks. Ahead on the ground lay the nude, frozen body of a young woman wearing nothing but a pair of socks. Authorities identified the body of Kelly Hall, who had been brutally raped and strangled to death. Forensic evidence points to a killer. Forensic scientists examined the blood samples, DNA, and hair samples on Kelly's body and found that Ferguson was a match. He continued to say he was home asleep in his bed on the night of the murder. But the police didn't believe him, and neither did the St. Louis County jury that convicted him of murder. The verdict was later reversed because of the faulty jury instruction, but... When the case was retired in 1994, Ferguson was again found guilty and sent to death row. As an inmate, Ferguson reportedly transformed himself in every imaginable way and became a case study for advocates of restorative justice over capital punishment. Additionally, the Innocence Project argued that the prosecution's hair and fiber analysis was flawed. Nevertheless, Jeffrey Ferguson was executed on March 26, 2014, after eating his last meal of barbecue ribs, french fries, and apple pie. Before the execution, Ferguson reportedly tried to lighten the mood by making funny faces at his relatives as he was strapped into the gurney. I'm sorry to have to be the cause that brings you all into this dark business of execution. I pray for the victim's family to have peace in their hearts one day and lose the anger, hate, and need for revenge that has driven them. Jeffrey Ferguson's last statement to the whole family. The Killer's Accomplice Kenneth Owsley, 
insisted he wasn't involved in the murder of Hall, even though he was at the scene. He watched Ferguson strangle Hall and helped him dispose of the teenager's body, but claimed he did not participate in her murder. He told police he helped Ferguson because he was afraid of him. As far as DNA evidence linking Owsley to the crime, there was none. There was no blood sample match either. The only physical evidence linking Owsley to the murder was the hair analysis evidence. A blonde hair on Owsley's shoe and a pubic hair linked to Owsley on Hull's sock. With the evidence and the fact that Owsley admitted to being at the scene, he could have been charged with murder and would most likely face a death sentence. But he entered a plea deal, pleading guilty to second-degree murder in 1993. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Where is Kenneth Owsley now? Kenneth Owsley was incarcerated in the South Central Correctional Center in Licking, Missouri, where he remains to this day. After serving 30 years, Owsley was scheduled for full parole in 2023. Kelly Hall's father, Jim Hall, previously stated that his family would fight to ensure that Owsley is never released. Forgiveness, Healing, and Regret Quote, It's been a very long 25 years waiting for this execution, said an emotional Jim Hall in 2014 after watching Jeffrey Ferguson's execution. My family and I have been devastated for years over this. She was 17 years old. She had her whole life in front of her. As the years went by, Hall's family learned to live with their grief. In more recent interviews, Jim Hall had decided finding forgiveness in his heart for Ferguson. He now wishes that Ferguson was not put to death, as no punishment can ever bring his daughter back, and he believes her killer became a changed man in prison. Quote, Ferguson conveyed such genuine remorse for the pain he caused both our family and his because of this horrible actions that we were able to forgive him then and there. We have since come to deeply regret his execution. I'm convinced significant healing would have occurred for us all if our family had changed in a frank conversation with him at the prison. I wished I had had the chance, consistent with my Christian beliefs, to have told him in person that I forgive him for what he did to our innocent and precious daughter. Jim Hall has also forgiven Kenneth Owsley for his role in the murder of Kelly. An American Tragedy, Kelly Hall, Documentary In 2018, filmmaker Lisa Roden Boyd released a documentary about the Hall and Ferguson families, the murder of Kelly Hall, and execution of Jeffrey Ferguson. An American Tragedy, described as one man's journey to death and another man's journey to forgive, also explored the concept of restorative justice and Jim Hall's regret about the execution of his daughter's killer. Boyd said that in her last interview with Ferguson, she saw a man who was reformed and redeemed. Making the film changed her perspective on the purpose of incarceration and punishment. Quote, I truly believe if you put someone in a place where they can learn a new way of thinking, it is possible for them to become a new person. The Death of Gabby Petito Van Life Ends in Partner Homicide Who was Gabby Petito? Gabby Petito was born on March 19, 1999 in Blue Point, New York. She had six younger siblings and half-siblings. In 2013, when she was 14, she appeared in a music video to raise awareness about gun violence in response to the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. In 2017, she met Brian Christopher Laundry at Bayport Blue Point High School. Petito started dating Laundry in March of 2019 and moved in with him and his parents in North Point, Florida. Gabby and Brian worked at Publix, where she was a pharmacy technician, and Brian was in the grocery department. The Long Road Trip 
In 2020, Gabby bought a van that was converted into a camper to fulfill her travel dreams with her fiancé. In July, Gabby quit her job and started a long road trip across America with Brian. According to her mother, Brian was calm and polite. Brian and Gabby were documenting their trip on YouTube and social media. Throughout the trip, Petito maintained regular contact with her family. For more than a month, the couple made their way across the country, exploring the most beautiful place in the U.S. and sharing them with their families and followers. Domestic Violence Incident It was the sixth week on the road when the police received a phone call from someone reporting domestic violence. The caller saw them fighting in front of a Moore Flower Community Cooperative in Moab, Utah. Another witness described the incident to police as looking like Petito and Laundry were talking aggressively and that Petito was punching Laundry in the arm. The witness said it looked like Laundry was trying to leave Petito behind. On August 12th, their van was stopped by police for an inspection. The two admitted to police that they had been pushing and shoving one another outside a grocery store. Laundry was scratched by Petito, who declined to press charges. The police report states that Laundry admitted to officers that their recent four or five months of travel had caused an emotional strain between them. I have some concerns about Gabby's long road trip. I told her to be careful and don't trust everybody. I felt safe knowing she was with Brian and thought he would take care of her, said Gabby's mother's statement to the media. The police report. According to the police report made after the domestic violence incident, Gabby was the primary aggressor in the case. When Laundry told Gabby to go for a walk to calm down, she reacted angrily and started slapping him. She squeezed between him and the van, so he grabbed her by the face and pushed her away. Police didn't cite them for domestic violence battery and separated them for the night. The officer wrote that the situation had not escalated to the level of a domestic assault as much that of a mental health crisis. Still, he suggested that the couple should spend the night apart, which they agreed to do. Cassie, Laundry's sister, made note that she never saw her brother being violent or abusive towards Gabby or anyone else. However, experts observed that Gabby's crying in the body cam video was a major indication of an abusive relationship. Gabby goes missing. Laundry took a flight from Salt Lake City to Tampa, Florida, leaving Petito behind on August 17th. Petito spent several days at a Fairfield Inn and Suites Hotel near Salt Lake City International Airport. On September 11th, shortly after ceasing regular communication with her friends and family, Gabby Petito went missing. According to reports, Petito was last seen in Wyoming's Grand Teton National Park. Here is a timeline of events that happened around Gabby's disappearance. On July 20, 2001, Gabby and Brian started a long road trip across America. On August 12th, the couple had an encounter with police in Utah after a witness reported them fighting. On August 17th, Laundry flew back to Florida to obtain some items from home. On August 19th, Gabby and Brian posted an eight-minute video documenting their van life journey on their Nomadic Static YouTube channel. On August 21st, Gabby's father, Joseph Petito, last spoke with his daughter and helped her order a pizza in Salt Lake City. He later said he did not notice any red flags during the conversation. On August 23rd, Laundry rejoined Gabby in Salt Lake City. On August 27th, Petito was last seen alive by a Louisiana couple vacationing in Jackson, Wyoming. The couple said Petito was in tears and Laundry was angry, going in and out of the restaurant several times. On August 30th, the Petito family received the last message from their daughter. No service in Yosemite. Investigation on September 11th, Gabby's mother reported her missing, and police started the investigation. Brian Laundry was a person of interest because Gabby was last seen with him. 
According to the police report, Laundry came back home alone on September 1st. Here is the timeline of incidents that happened in September after Gabby went missing. On September 1st, Laundry returned home. On September 6th, Laundry and his family went to a campground. On September 11th, Gabby's mother reported her missing after not being able to communicate with her for several days. Laundry and his family refused to talk with investigators. On September 16th, Gabby's family issued a letter to their attorney and begged for the Laundry family's help in the investigation. The Laundries refused to cooperate. Disappearance of Laundry. On September 17th, Brian Laundry's family requested the police come to their home, where they told investigators that they hadn't seen Brian since September 14th. This was just another twist in the story. His family said that he left for hiking in a Florida nature reserve on September 13th. Discovery of Gabby's Remains The FBI conducted ground surveys in Grand Teton National Park relevant to Petito's disappearance. On September 19th, the FBI held a news conference to discuss the discovery of human remains in Teton County. Her identity was confirmed through an autopsy conducted by Teton County's coroner. The autopsy report revealed that she had been killed three to four weeks before the body's discovery with blunt force injuries to the head and neck with manual strangulation. The search for Brian Laundry. Laundry's lawyer stated that Laundry was upset when he left home for the last time on September 14th. On October 5th, in an interview with ABC News, Laundry's sister encouraged him to surrender to authorities. Gabby's mother stated to the media, I want Brian found alive so I can look him in the eyes. Investigators had searched for Brian Laundry for about a month in a Florida nature reserve that spans nearly 25,000 acres. According to Robert Urban, the founder and chief instructor of the Urban Survival Academy, it is highly unlikely that someone who had not received formal training in survival techniques could have lasted this long in the reserve. On October 20th, Laundry's skeletal remains and some of his belongings were found in the Mayakahachi Creek Environmental Park. This area had recently been underwater due to flooding. At first, the autopsy report couldn't reveal the cause of death for Laundry. On November 23rd, forensic anthropologists announced that Brian died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. On January 21st, 2022, the FBI named Laundry as Gabby's killer and closed the case. I thought it was merciful that it was what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. From the moment I decided to take away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. From Brian Laundry's notebook. Petito Case and Public Interest Compared to previous murder and missing people cases, the case got more media attention and public curiosity because they posted videos of their voyage, inviting followers to follow along, showing the couple as seemingly content doing cartwheels on the beach, trekking up mountains, and setting up camp in the Utah desert. The visuals contrasted with the reality of domestic violence and Gabby's violent murder at the hands of her partner. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these True Crime Cases, Volume 13. Before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Matt Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewall, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the channel. I appreciate you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please stay safe and take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.